I want to continue the series that we've been doing on imprecatory prayers. And as you remember from the first study, um, the word imprecatory is not in the Bible, um, but the, the concept is an imprecatory prayer is, an, is a prayer that is invoking evil or curses on someone, uh, which would seem to be, to some people, would be contrary to the scripture. It doesn't sound like a Christian thing to do to be raining down curses and um, invoking evil on people. But as we read through the Bible, especially through the Psalms, we have seen for the last few weeks that there are a lot of imprecatory prayers um, in, the, in the Bible, in the Psalms in particular, and mostly from David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. And David was uh, a man after God's own heart. And so there is instruction here for us. Next Sunday, as I mentioned, I plan to conclude the study, and I want to spend most of next Sunday looking at other biblical considerations regarding prayer and give a balanced view so that we are not completely shying away from imprecatory prayers because they're clearly scriptural, but on the other hand, that we're not overdoing it and we're not praying prayers that we shouldn't be uh, because we certainly don't want to be in that case. So we're still in the Psalms. We've just been going through each of the Psalms that contain imprecations. And we come to Psalm 109, which is probably the most imprecatory of the imprecatory prayers, uh, I would say. I would say it's the most imprecatious of the imprecatory prayers, but I looked up the word imprecatious and it doesn't exist until today. But now it does because I just made it up. So yeah, this one is... Um, this one would definitely... For a lot of people, I think, ourselves included, we read through this and be like, ooh, I, I can't imagine saying something like that. Like, this is some very, very strong language. Uh, and in this prayer, David, or this psalm, David is praying that God would judge the wicked, who first of all lied about him. Uh, psalm 109 and verses 1 through 2, he says, Hold not thy peace, O God, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked... And the, mouth, and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. So these people are deceitful and they're lying about David. And he experienced a lot of this throughout his life with people that he couldn't trust. And then they spoke hateful words toward him. And they fought against him without a cause. There in verse 3. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause without a just cause. There's no good reason for what they were doing to him. And then they rewarded him evil for good and hatred for his love, he said there in verses 4 and 5. He says, For my love they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And the prayer that he gives himself unto here is pretty interesting as we read the rest of the psalm. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. So David had not mistreated these people to receive what he was receiving. He had shown love to them. He received back hatred. He's a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ in this sense. Lord, Lord Jesus Christ came and showed love to men, and he received back from them hatred from the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, they, they hated him without a cause, he said. Uh, they, they spoke evil against him. They said he had a devil. They called him a blasphemer. They, um, they had no love for him. And this is ultimately a messianic, it's not a messianic psalm exactly, but it is a psalm prophesying of the times of the Messiah, which we will see uh, later on. So David prayed that God would do the following to his enemies, and one enemy in particular. As we read through these verses that we're going to look at here in Psalm 109, he switches from saying them, because up until now he's talked about them, and then he switches in verse 6 down to about verse 19 or so, He's talking about an individual person. He says him. And so he's praying against one person in particular. And we will see the reason for this exceedingly harsh prayer after we get through these verses. So I'm going to go through all the verses first, and we're going to look at them. I'm just going to make some brief comment. And then I think I have a pretty good explanation as to why some of these horribly harsh things were spoken by David against this man. So let's just look at uh, verses 6 down through verse 20. He says, uh, verse 6, Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. So 
he's praying that God would give this man wicked masters, wicked tyrants to be over him, to be lording it over him. Let him be tempted by Satan. Let him be tormented by Satan. Let Satan be at his right hand. Let Satan be nice and close to him to, to cause him grief. Uh, verse 7, when he shall be judged, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. So let justice prevail against this man. Let him, when he comes up before the bar of justice, let him be condemned, David's praying. He says, let his prayer become sin. And I was thinking about that, like how does prayer become sin? But if you are a wicked person, like this person that David is imprecating against, and you would go to God in prayer, and you're praying in God's name or in Jesus' name, you know what you're really doing? And you're not doing it in sincerity of heart? You're taking God's name in vain, right? Your prayer becomes sin. You're actually sinning by praying if you're a wicked person and you're not really seeking, truly seeking the Lord. And God, and the Bible tells us that God does not hear the prayers of sinners. Uh, let's just look at it. I'll just give you a few verses here. Uh, Proverbs 15 and verse 29. When he says here, let his prayer become sin. Well, this is, this is how it would become sin because God has no time for it to, to, to God a prayer from a wicked person is just a, a source of disgust in his eyes. Uh, Proverbs 15 and verse 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. So if he, you know, by contrast there, he hears the prayer of the righteous, what does that mean about the prayer of the wicked? He doesn't hear it, right? He's far from the wicked. He doesn't want to hear their prayers. First uh, Peter three and verse twelve, talking about people here who are reprobates, who are in their natural state of death and trespasses and sins when they're at enmity against God, and God doesn't want to hear such prayers. First uh, Peter three and verse twelve. Peter says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Again, the contrast. If God's prayers, if his ears are open unto the prayers of the righteous, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, what does that say? His ears are not open to their prayers. Right? And this is basically what David is praying about for this man. Let his prayer become sin. Let his, God looks at sin, and God can't look at sin. God hates sin. God look, it's disgusted by sin. Let him feel that way about this man's prayers, David says. Pretty strong language, isn't it? Uh, John 9, ver, in verse 31, uh, the, the blind man that Jesus healed, he said there that we knoweth that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, him he heareth. I've just basically paraphrased it there, close, close quote anyway. So back to Psalm 109, Psalm 109, verse, in verse, um, verse 8, Psalm 109 and verse 8. Now, hold back your judgment until we get through this psalm, because I'm not telling you to go out and pray these words against people that you don't like, or people that have wronged you or something. I'm not telling you to pray these things, and I have good reason for that, so just Hold your judgment. I'm just going through the psalm and I'm explaining what David is praying, what he's talking about, why he's doing it, and then we'll look at you know, the, the, the bigger reason of what's really going on here. Verse 8, he says, Let his days be few and let another take his office. He's praying for this man to die early, in other words. Let his days be few. And this is not an unbiblical prayer necessarily because God says in uh, Psalm 55 and verse 23 that um, I, I could turn there but I was trying to remember it um, bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days so God says you're a bloody and you're a deceitful man you're going to die early you're not going to live out half your days right so this is the will of God for bloody and deceitful wicked evil men they don't live out half their days and David here is basically praying that same thing. Let his days be few. Let another take his office. And this has happened throughout history, right? Uh, evil kings in Israel and biblical history, um, and then evil kings throughout world history have, some of them not lived out half their days, and they've had their offices taken and other given to others. Julius Caesar was murdered by his own 
uh, people, right? And, and another took his office. Alexander the Great literally didn't live out half his days. I think he died at third, early 30s or something. Conquered the whole known world and then died and, and cried like a baby afterwards after conquering the whole world because there was nobody left to conquer. Nobody left to murder and he felt so bad about it. He ended up, I don't know why, but anyway, he died in his early 30s. Uh, so yeah, these these type of of um, despots often don't live out half their days. Uh, Psalm 109 and verse 9, Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Again, praying for his death. Verse 10, it even gets worse. Let his children become, or let his children be continually vagabonds, which means fugitives or wanderers, or just out there just kind of wandering around with no home, no, you know, no, no dwelling place, just as beggars, and beg. Let them be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. And he's actually imprecating against the children of this evil man. And like I said, this is, this is exceedingly harsh. But I think there's a reason for it. Like I said, we'll get to it here in a minute. Uh, verse 10, let his children be... Cont- oh, I already said verse 10. Verse 11, let the extortioner catch all that he hath and let the strangers spoil his labor. So bring the man to poverty. Just let him be... Let, let somebody come in there and rob him, pillage him, lawsuits, whatever, and just take everything that he has. Uh, verse 12, let there be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. So he actually prays that, that nobody will show mercy to him. Let nobody even show mercy to his fatherless children. You know, that's a, that's a terrible thing. Verse 13, let his posterity be cut off. Now he actually prays that his children will be killed. To cut off, cut off means to be killed. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. So just cut this man off, cut his children off, cut his name out, so nobody remembers who this man ever was. He has no children to pass down his name. That's what David is praying here. That's why I say this is the most imprecatory of the imprecatory prayers. It doesn't get uh, probably any more harsh than this. Verse 14, Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. So he prays to have his name blotted out, so his his descendants, they're going to be gone, and nobody's going to remember his name, but he wants God to remember the sin of his father and his mother. So remember what an evil family this was, but don't even remember the rest of the family. Just remember how evil they started out. That's what he's praying for. Verse 15. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. You know, it says in Proverbs uh, 10.7 that uh, the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. This is basically what he's praying for, that this man's name will rot. Cut off the memory of him from the earth. Verse 16, Because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. Now we sort of get a, a window into the nature of this evil man he's praying against. He didn't show mercy. He persecuted the poor and needy. He slew the broken in heart. He finds some guy that's down and out, and rather than helping him back up, he just kills him. You know, he's the kind of guy that would come across the man that was half dead, right? Then the Good Samaritan came across the guy that was half dead, right? Broken in heart. And he would have just killed him instead of pouring oil and wine into his wounds and taking him to an inn and paying for his care and all that. Not this guy that David's talking about. This guy who just killed him. This is the kind of man that, that David is talking about. As he loved cursing, let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. So this man loved to curse. This is characteristic of the wicked. Remember Romans 3.14 when it describes man under sin and he says his mouth is full of cursing and bitterness? You know, this isn't somebody that misses the nail and pounds his thumb with a hammer and lets out a bad word once in a while. This is somebody whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. He loved cursing. He didn't delight in blessing. And so David says, all right, well, then let it be far from him. Let blessing be far from him. He didn't like blessing. He liked cursing. Well, let him have some cursing. 
verse 18, as he loved himself, as he clothed himself, pardon me, as he clothed himself with cursing, like as with a garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. This man wore curses like he put on a coat. It was when you looked at him, you just saw a man full of cursing. He was just clothed with it. Verse 19, let it be unto him as the garment which covereth him, and for a girdle wherewith he is girded continually. So let cursing cover him. He likes it so much, let him be the object of it. In verse 20, let this be the reward of mine adversaries for, from the Lord and of them that speak evil against my soul. Now, like I said, that is a very, very harsh prayer. Praying that the man would, would die. Praying that his children would be beggars and vagabonds. And then praying that they would die. And that their name would be cut off from the earth. And uh, that nobody would have mercy on them. And all these, these terrible things. Why would David pray that about anybody? About one of his enemies? Even if the man was so evil and so hateful toward him, why would he pray that? And I think I have an answer for it. It's because this prayer is a, is a prophecy of Judas Iscariot. And we know that from verse 8. Psalm 109 and verse 8. It says, Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Now if you go over to Acts 1 and verse 20, this verse, or part of this verse, is quoted by the Apostle Peter, and he shows that it was referring to Judas Iscariot, the man that betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's talking about Judas here. He, um, if, you just, if you go back to um, verse 17. For he was numbered with us. He's talking about, uh, talking about Judas. Well, there's, okay, let me back up one more verse. There it is. 16. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us, and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that, that field is called in their proper tongue a seldoma, that is to say the field of blood, for it is written in the book of Psalms, he's going to quote first of all Psalm 69, then he's going to quote Psalm 109, which we've already looked at Psalm 69 in this series, I think it was last week or the week before, probably last week. Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, that's from Psalm 69.25, and from Psalm 109 and verse 8, and his bishopric let another take. Bishopric is an office. Let his office another take. And this is Psalm 109.8. Let his days be few and let another take his office. So now it becomes a little more understandable why David is praying these things as he is. Because he's really, he, he is probably focused on some evil man that actually did him wrong. But what he's really praying is he's praying beyond that man. And he's praying a prophecy of, the, of Judas Iscariot who betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ and the imprecations that are against Judas for what he did. Judas Iscariot was a reprobate child of the devil who betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ and went to hell. I'll give you three verses. Uh, John 6 and verse 70. John 6 and verse 70. Jesus answered them, to, talking to his disciples, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He's talking about Judas. Well, I mean, the next verse tells you that. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So Judas was a devil. So if you think about, say, uh, David praying a prayer against a devil, and praying these things against a devil then all of a sudden it becomes a little more understandable why he's praying such harsh things because he's praying against a devil. He's praying against Judas Iscariot. Uh, Matthew 26 and verse 24. Matthew 26 and verse 24. 
Jesus said, The Son of Man cometh, goeth, as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. No matter how good your life is on this earth, if you end up in hell, it would be better off that you were never born. And that's what he's saying about Judas. It would have been better off him had he never been born where he's going. And then in John 17 and verse 12, he called him the son of perdition. John 17 and verse 12. Well, again, our Lord Jesus speaking. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Perdition means destruction, the son of destruction. He's got destruction in his future. So, this is why I think that it is likely the reason that David prayed such harsh words against his enemy, because his words were really aimed at the man who betrayed the Son of God. That's why I don't, I'm not going to be praying things like that towards anybody, no matter how wicked they are, no matter what they've done to me or anybody else. Uh, I don't think I would ever be praying anything quite like that. And I don't recommend that you do either, because this is something that was really aimed at the man that betrayed the Son of God. So if you find a man of that caliber, I guess you can pray these kind of words at him, but I don't think you're going to find a, probably a man of that caliber in your life, uh, more than likely. All right, let's move on to the next psalm, and that is Psalm 129. In Psalm 129, the psalmist, speaking on behalf of the people of God, imprecated against the wicked who afflicted them. Let's look at the first three verses. Psalm 129, 1 through 3. It says, Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth, may Israel now say. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed upon my back, they made long their furrows. Probably, again, another prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they lashed him, I mean, they made furrows, like when a plow goes through a field and rolls it over. I mean, they made big lashes in his back, uh, which is probably what this is referring to. But here, anyway, you have people that are uh, afflicting the people of God. They're not prevailing, but they're certainly trying to. And here the psalmist prayed that God would not, or would let those that hate Zion be confounded turned back and withered like grass. Let's look at verses uh, 5 and 6. He says, Let them all be confounded and turned back that hate Zion. Zion is another name for Jerusalem, which is representative of the people of Israel itself, of the house of God, where it was located. So when he talks about hating Zion, he's talking about hating the people of God. Let them all be confounded and turn back that hate Zion, let them be as the grass upon the housetops which withereth before it groweth up. Now, you probably remember from the past three weeks, uh, it's been demonstrated that this is in accord with the revealed will of God to desire that persecutors of the church will be confounded. We look at verses which God straight up says, the people that persecute his church, his people, he will confound them. And so the psalmist here, when he prays that they'll be confounded, He's just praying that God would do exactly what God said he would do to the persecutors of his people. And it's also in accord with the will of God uh, to pray that the wicked would be cut down and wither is the grass. Because again, this is what God says he will do to them. Psalm 37, 1 through 2. Now I freely admit I have prayed this prayer. I've prayed this prayer in church. You remember when the whole COVID thing was happening? And I did a sermon on part of Psalm 37 called fret not thyself because of the lockdowns or something. I was, I was very, I was preaching the sermon for myself. Basically I was, I was angry at what was happening and how we were being tyrannized and more so more than being tyrannized. I was angry that virtually everybody just rolled over and took it and nobody stood up against it. And I was, that it was very demoralizing to me to see what happened in our country and so I needed to preach to myself, to tell myself, quit being angry, quit fretting about this. 
Uh, but in that sermon, I mentioned about praying that God gets out the weed eater and starts mowing down the wicked. Uh, and, I mean, it, it's a biblical prayer. Uh, Psalm 37, 1 through 2. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. So that's what happens to the workers of iniquity. Cut down. And that's basically what the psalmist is praying for here in Psalm uh, 129. Let them be as the grass upon the housetops, which withereth afore it groweth up. So he's praying that the wicked will have done to them what God says he will do to such people. And Psalm 129, I would say, especially verses 5 and 6, was a model prayer to pray against the governments which ordered churches to close during the COVID-19 scandemic. And I have a little note right there next to Psalm 129. I have several notes in my Bible about the whole COVID-19 thing because I don't want to forget about it. I never want to forget what those people did to us, uh, God being my helper. Now, if the tyrants ever came up and personally asked me for forgiveness, certainly I would forgive them. And I've forgiven them in the sense that I'm not harboring wrath and hatred toward them or something. I'm not, I don't lay, up, lay at night and, and I'm angry about what they did. But I'm not forgetting about it. And I don't ever want it to happen again. And um, I think they ought to be held accountable for it. I think they ought to be taken and tried and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law for all the lives that they ruined and all the lives that they took uh, through that whole thing. But just look at this verse and, and just think about what we went through here a few years ago. Verses 5 and 6 again. Let them all be confounded and turn back that hate Zion. Zion is the people of God. Zion is the church. I dare say that the people that locked us down, the people that issued orders that churches could not assemble, that closed churches, they hate Zion. Those people hate the churches of God. Now, they may not say that they do, but their actions demonstrate the fact that they hate the churches of God. If the Clay County Public Health Director issues an order that says churches have to close, but Walmart can stay open. Obviously, this is not a matter of, we just can't have people go anywhere, everybody's going to die. If they can go to Walmart, but they can't go to church, that man hates church. Now, I don't know what his, I don't know what his religion is at all. I mean, maybe he goes to church, maybe he would say otherwise, but his actions demonstrate that that man hates the churches of God. And I really regret, I sat right next to him at a Chamber of Commerce luncheon. I didn't know who he was. And then he introduced himself. I'm like, oh, I know who this guy is. And I didn't say anything. And I wish so badly now I would have said, do you regret like, closing down businesses and churches and destroying people's lives and, and causing immeasurable harm to all these people and all these children and all that you've done? Do you regret any of that? Do you feel bad about any of that? I wish so badly now I would have. I just sat there and didn't say anything. Oh, well. He's not in office anymore. Thank the Lord. Hopefully the next guy's better. I don't know any, I don't know much about him. But anyway. But what that man needs to do, if he disagrees, if he disagrees that he hates the church of God, he needs to publicly repent. So, you know, I was wrong for closing down or for ordering churches to close down. I was wrong. I violated the law of God by doing that wickedness. And you know what? Churches that obey the orders need to publicly say the same thing. I shouldn't have obeyed these wicked orders. Anyway, if last sermons didn't get last week's sermon didn't get taken down from YouTube, this one certainly will. Psalm 137. Let's go to the next one. But I don't mind harping on that topic once in a while because, like I said, I don't ever want you to forget what they did to us and I don't ever want it to happen again. Psalm 137. This is a lamentation written by a Jewish exile uh, in Babylon. This would have been after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and carried all the Jews off to Babylon and they were there for 70 years. This would have been written during that 70-year period. 
Uh, in verses 7 through 9, he asks God to remember what the Babylonians said and did when they destroyed Jerusalem and to repay them for it. Uh, verses 7 through 9, Psalm 137. Uh, remember, O Lord, the children of Edom, and he's referring to the Babylonians under the term Edom. Edom were people that were rejected by God, an evil, you know, evil nation, uh, the nation of Esau. Uh, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, raise it, raise it. Now that's R-A-S, right? That's not, that's not R-A-I-S-E, that's R-A-S-E, or R-A-Z-E would be an alternate spelling of that, I think, which means to take it right down to the ground, to just like, bulldoze it. Okay? Raise it, raise it, even to the foundations thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Now again, that's a very harsh thing to say. Um, to say that the happy, blessed, basically the man that bashes your baby's heads against stones is uh, going to be blessed. Is a That's a very harsh thing to say. Again, I'm, I'm not recommending that you say something like that. I'm not planning on saying something like that in prayer. But that's what this psalmist said. Um, and that is indeed what would happen. And that was indeed, as sad as it is to say, that was God's will because that was the judgment of Babylon that would happen to them. Um, but again, mercy rejoiceth against judgment, so I'm not going to be praying something quite like that, I don't believe. But he was asking God to recompense Babylon for the cruelty they showed to Jerusalem and its inhabitants. Uh, God had already determined to destroy Babylon after he was done using them as a scourge to punish his people. So what, what this man is praying is according to the revealed will of God that, that God would eventually do to the Babylonians you know, in several more years, you know, when the 70 years were up. Uh, Isaiah 13, let me just give you the verse. Isaiah 13 and verse 1, this is a prophecy against Babylon in Isaiah 13. It says, The burden of Babylon which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. And then if you go down to verses 6 through 9, it says, Howl ye, uh, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. So he's going to destroy Babylon, in other words. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth, they shall be amazed one at another. So they're going to be like out of their minds, like totally scared out of their minds. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. So what the psalmist was praying there in Psalm 137 is basically what God was going to do to Babylon. Um, so he wasn't praying anything that was outside of the will of God, even though what he was saying is very harsh. The psalmist was praying for the Lord to take vengeance on the wicked, which is a biblical desire. Now, we're not to take vengeance on the wicked, but to pray that God will take the vengeance when he sees fit, that is biblical. Uh, Romans 12 and verse 19. And I think it's best to just, when you pray something like that, you just pray that God take vengeance on them as you see fit, when you see fit. And then that way, you're not telling God what to do. You're not saying anything that is unbiblical. You're just saying, Lord, you just you take vengeance on them as you have said, when you want to, in the way in which you want to. Uh, Romans 12 and verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So it's not wrong to pray that God will do what he says he's going to do. Right? There's nothing wrong with that, obviously. Uh, i just give you a couple, of, a few more verses here in uh, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 35. Deuteronomy 32, 35. This is the Lord speaking. He says, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, 
and the things that shall come upon them make haste. So you know, God would take vengeance on, um, on wicked people. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 10 is another one. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 10. And repayeth them that hate him to their face, to destroy them, he will not be slack to him that hateth him, he will repay him to his face. Right? So God is the one that repays to those people that hate him. And then one more in Psalm 94 and verses 1 through 2. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself, lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth, render a reward to the proud. Which is what the psalmist there in Psalm 137 is essentially praying, that the Lord take vengeance on Babylon for what they had done to Israel. And God repays the wicked with the same affliction that they afflicted upon others. See, because this is what basically what the psalmist was praying there in Psalm 137, that um, that rewarded, he says there in verse 8, Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee, as thou hast served us. You know, so you basically get the same thing that you gave to us. You know, somebody else is going to reward that to you. And this is how God's judgment works. God judges people with the same affliction that they inflicted upon others. Let me give you a verse here in Judges 1, 6 through 7. Judges 1, 6 through 7. This is the old biblical principle. You reap what you sow. Right? You, if you, you sow wickedness, you will reap the same, the Bible says. And, and this is what God does. The same measure that you meet, it shall be measured unto you, Jesus said. There's, there was a, uh, a king. His name was Adonai, uh, Adonai, Adonai Bezek. And this is in uh, Judges 1 and verse 6 and 7. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. That would be a terrible thing. And Adonai, Adonai Bezek which means uh, Lord of Bezek. Adonai means Lord. So Lord of Bezek. So he was basically the, the king, the, the ruler of this place, Bezek. He said, three score and ten kings. So 70 kings. Three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table, as I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem. And there he died. So this king cut off the thumbs and big toes of 70 kings and well guess what happened to him when he got caught they cut off his thumb and big toe and he recognized it you know I did it to them the Lord requited me and, and paid me back in kind so this is what the psalmist there in Psalm 137 was looking forward to alright let's go to Psalm 140 I think if I remember right, there were 19 psalms that contained imprecations in them. So uh, you see that this is very, very common in the psalms. Psalm 140. We'll look at verses 1 through 5. Here David prayed that, uh, to God that he would preserve him from evil, violent men who plotted to overthrow him and laid snares for him. <clears throat> Psalm 141 through 5. It says, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. Kind of like some of the people in the cabinets of the presidential administrations that we've had over the years that just delight in war. They just can't wait to go over and overthrow other nations and, and massacre people. Gather themselves together for war. Imagine mischiefs in their hearts dream up reasons why we need to go over and bomb other countries for no good reason. Verse 3, They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Selah. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man. 
who have purposed to overthrow my goings. The proud have hid a snare for me, and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me. Selah. So these people are laying snares for him. They're going to war with him. They're laying traps for him. They're trying to catch him. Right? They are evil people. <clears throat> and so he prayed that God would not grant their desires, nor further their wicked devices, lest they would exalt themselves. Uh, in verse 8, he says, Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked, further not his wicked device, lest they exalt themselves. Selah. And this would be this is a great prayer for us to pray. Further not his wicked device. Grant not their desires. You know, we're told to pray for our leaders, and we should, you know, to pray for all that are in authority, that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. And it's a good idea to pray that they'll have wisdom, to pray that they'll make good decisions. But it's also a good idea to pray like this. Grant not their wicked devices, because they do a lot of evil, right? Don't allow them to do the wicked things that they want to do. That, that's a great prayer to pray, lest they exalt themselves. Don't allow their wicked devices to be furthered. Those are good prayers to pray for our leaders. Then David imprecates against them and asks God to judge them using their own wickedness. Uh, verse 9. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. So basically, judge them with their own wickedness. This is a, a biblical prayer. We've seen this already uh, multiple times in this study. Uh, he prays that, uh, that they'll be cast into deep pits of fire, which sounds like hell to me. Uh, verse 10. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits that they rise not up again. It kind of sounds like hell, doesn't it? I mean, coals of fire on them, deep pits of fire that they rise up not again from. Pretty much praying that God will send them to hell. And as has been shown earlier in this study, these prayers are according to the will of God because God does send wicked people to hell and this is what uh, David is praying for. Now, as I said before, we don't know who the children of God are necessarily, and who they aren't. You could be praying that God will send some guy to hell, and I don't recommend you do that. But you could be praying God send this guy to hell, and it could be a Saul of Tarsus, who's yet to be converted, right? So um, I, I, don't, I don't recommend that you be praying that God sends people to hell. You can just pray that God judges people according to their works, that God does with them as he wants, but you know, I, I'm not, I don't want to be on record as praying that God sends a, a wayward child of God to hell. And then he lastly prays that God will not let an evil speaker be established in the earth and states that violent men, or that the violent man will be hunted by evil and overthrown. Verse 11. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. <clears throat> this is actually a biblical prayer also. Uh, because the Bible does talk about how evil pursues sinners. Um, it, it, evil does hunt uh, the wicked and overthrow them. I just have a couple of verses for you. Uh, Proverbs 13 and verse 21. Proverbs 13, 21. It says, evil pursueth sinners, but to the righteous, good shall be repaid. So, basically what he was saying there in Psalm 140. Evil, let the evil pursue them. And then uh, the Lord said in Deuteronomy 28, 15, that if they didn't obey, that all these curses would come upon them and overtake them. The, the, the curse would pursue them and overtake them. All right. We're getting close to the end of the Psalms. We have two more left. Uh, Psalm 141. This just has one verse of imprecation in it. In verse 10. Again, a Psalm of David. He says, Let the wicked fall into their own nets, whilst, uh, whilst that I withal escape. 
Let them fall into their own nets. And we've already seen this in the previous studies that this is, uh, prayers like this have been prayed and we saw that um, this is God's signature judgment. Let the wicked fall into their own nets. He that rolleth a stone, it'll roll upon him. Uh, he that diggeth a pit shall fall therein. Right. So these are our biblical principles. So um, that's that's a perfectly fine prayer to pray. You know, let let Fauci get harmed by his own vaccine that he promoted. Let Gates get harmed by his own vaccine or whatever. You know, let him fall into his own pit. Um, you know, there wouldn't be anything wrong uh, with praying something like that. I don't think. Psalm 143 is the last psalm. Psalm 143. Now in this psalm, David is overwhelmed. Uh, his spirit's overwhelmed within him. He's desolate. He said there in verse 4. And so he's, he's in a bad way. And while feeling overwhelmed and sorely depressed, he prays that the Lord would deliver him from his enemies. In verse 9. He says, deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies, I flee unto thee to hide me. And then he prayed that God would, in mercy toward him, cut off his enemies and destroy them. In verse 12. And of thy mercy, cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. Now, we, we saw here a week or so ago that to cut off means to kill. So he's basically telling, asking God to kill his enemies who were trying to kill him. I mean, he has these people that are out there how, you know, chasing him all around. He spent years on the run and he's praying that God would kill his enemies. And this prayer is in accord with the word of God, which declares that God will cut off and destroy evildoers. Psalm 37 and verse 9. There's actually four verses in Psalm 37 that say this. Psalm 37 and verse 9. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. Uh, verse 28, For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Verse 34, Wait on the Lord, and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the, the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. So it's going to just wait. It's going to happen, the Lord says. In verse 38, But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. So four times God tells us that he's going to cut off. He's going to destroy. Um, remove from the earth wicked people. So David was just praying for what God said that he would do. All right, now I, will, I want to look at three other books, and this won't take nearly as long as the Psalms did. I want to look at three other books of the Old Testament where imprecatory prayers were made, or at least imprecatory statements, and then that'll take care of today's sermon. The next time we're going to look at imprecatory prayers in the New Testament, and then we're going to look at some of the, the um, instruction there on how we're not to hate our enemies, we're to love our enemies, we're to pray for our enemies, we're to be merciful, and, and those kind of things. And we're going to balance this whole thing out so that we make sure that we're not uh, going overboard um, with the imprecations. So let's first of all look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah was quite the leader. He cursed his own countrymen who had married foreign women and had children that couldn't speak the Jews' language. Uh, Nehemiah 13... 23 through 27. That's a sure way to destroy a nation, is to have people that don't speak the language. And you got a nation where people are all speaking a bunch of different languages and nobody can understand each other. Uh, that, that is, that, a nation like that is doomed for destruction. Uh, Nehemiah 13, 23 through 27. In those days also I saw, or saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. So these foreign nations that weren't, uh, didn't worship the God of Israel. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. 
See, this is going to be, Nehemiah recognizes this is going to be a problem. We're going to lose our nation here if we got these, you know, marrying foreigners of different religions and then our kids can't even speak the language and, you know, we're going to have a, we're going to have a mess here. So he did something about it. This is quite the leader. And I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or yourself, or for yourselves. So he cursed them, he smote some of them, he plucked off their hair, he ripped their hair out, and he made them swear by God. I mean, think about that. Think about that. I like Nehemiah's version better. Ezra got upset about something similar, and Ezra pull, pulled out his own hair. I mean, why do that when you can pull out somebody else's? You know? <laughs> yeah, Nehemiah was quite a guy. And he wasn't just some ungodly, rageful person or something. You read through Nehemiah, this man was a man of prayer. Every decision he made, just go read it sometime. He prayed to the God of heaven. He prayed to the God of heaven. He prayed to the God of heaven. This is a godly man. Contending, cursing, smoting, and ripping hair out. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, despite being loved of God, despite being the wisest man in the world, despite being the richest man in the world, nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. See, Nehemiah's point is, hey, if outlandish, meaning foreign women of different religions, if they caused Solomon, the best among us, to sin, how do you think you're going to get away with it? That's what he's telling them. Shall we then hearken unto you uh, to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God and marrying strange wives? How far did I want to read? Uh, that was it. That was it. Verse 27. So he, he really gave them the gears about this. Now, this wasn't an imprecatory prayer per se, but it was an imprecatory statement. He cursed them, right? Contended with them. And, but Nehemiah is, well, for one thing, um, he's a prophet of God, so he's speaking under inspiration of God, right? This is written under inspiration of God. So this shows us that imprecations are not necessarily evil because, you know, here's a, here's a man, a prophet of God that's, that's doing it. Um, and it's recorded for our admonition, for our learning, Paul tells us in, in Romans 15. Uh, but then also Nehemiah's actions were in keeping with the will of God because the people of Israel were forbidden to marry people from the Canaanite nations, from those wicked nations of false religions. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, 2 through 4. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them. This is talking about the, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Hivites, all these other, all these nations in the land of Canaan. Uh, they were, um, God was going to deliver them before thee. Thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou give unto thy son. And here's the reason. For they will turn away thy son from following me. It doesn't say they might. It says they will that's the danger of marrying somebody of a, of a false religion. They will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So God warned them against marrying women of these foreign pagan nations. And God also, in the book of Deuteronomy, in, verse, in chapter 27... In verse 26, pronounced a curse upon any of the Israelites who would not keep the law. Deuteronomy 27, 26. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. So God said, don't marry these foreign women, and if you break this law, you're cursed. Well, guess what Nehemiah did? He enforced the law of God that they weren't supposed to marry foreign women, and he cursed his own people for breaking the law. 
right? He cursed his people for breaking the law, and God says, you break the law, you're cursed. Nehemiah basically did what God said. That's all. He therefore acted in accordance with the word of God. All right, let's look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah 18. We looked at another imprecation by Jeremiah in the beginning of this series, and that was sort of the, the model that we used to, to show that uh, everything that Jeremiah imprecated against them, we went and looked and we saw that, that God says that he'll do these very things in each case. So uh, Jeremiah is basically where we started, and um, now we're going to get back to one more place in this book. Jeremiah 18, 18 through 23. <clears throat> So after Jeremiah repeatedly warned the nation of Judah of the the impending judgment of God, they rejected his reproofs and spoke against him. Uh, That's in verse 18, Jeremiah 18, 18. Then said they, come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word of the prophet, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us smite him with the tongue and let us not give heed to any of his words. So they're shooting the messenger. They don't like what he has to say. They say, let's let's smite him with the tongue. Let's slander him. Let's condemn him. Let's let's make sure that everybody thinks he's evil. We're going to go out there and whisper and backbite and try to destroy this man, destroy his character. Well, Jeremiah has finally had enough. And then he imprecates against them, praying that God would destroy them, not hear their prayers, and not forgive them. Verses 19 through 23. He says, Give heed to me, O Lord, and hearken to the voice of them that contend with me. Shall evil be recompensed for good? For they have digged a pit for my soul. Remember that I stood before thee to speak good for them and to turn away thy wrath from them. See, Jeremiah tried to turn away God's wrath. He tried to speak good for them. He tried to save these people. He tried to tell them the truth. He tried to get them to repent. He cared for them. He loved them. And you know what he got back? Just hatred. He got back evil for good. And he's just, he's done at this point. Verse 21. Therefore deliver up their children to the famine and pour out their blood by the force of the sword and let their wives be bereaved of their children and be widows and let their men be put to death. Let their young men be slain by the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard from their houses when thou shalt bring a troop suddenly upon them for they have digged a pit to take me and hid snares for my feet yet Lord thou knowest all their counsel against me to slay me forgive not their iniquity neither blot out their sin from thy sight but let them be overthrown before thee deal thus with them in the time of thine anger this is against his own countrymen against his own people But he was just, you know, he was so fed up. He said, Lord, judge him, judge him severely. Just take him out, wipe him out, and don't forgive them. Don't hear their prayers. That sounds very harsh. But you know what? Jeremiah was doing exactly what God told him to do. Jeremiah 14 and verse 11. Jeremiah 14, 11. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. When people get so bad and they have pushed the limit so far and God's long suffering is done, God says, don't pray for their good anymore. He tells John in 1 John, or John tells us in 1 John, that there's a sin unto death. And he says, I say not that ye pray for that. Right? So there is a sin. If you see a brother's sin that's not unto death, pray God will have mercy on him. I can give you the verse. It's in um, <clears throat> It's in 1 John... Um, Let's see here. First John five and verse sixteen. It's a good good verse to make a uh, cross reference there with that Jeremiah verse. If any man see uh, see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that ye, should, that ye shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. 
Of course, all sins, you know, the wages of sin is death. So, I mean, any sin will condemn you in the eyes of God. But he's referring to certain sins refer, get specific penalties. There are certain sins in the Bible that get death penalties in this life, and certain sins don't get death penalties. There are certain sins that get death penalties when it comes to church fellowship. Certain sins require you to be separated from church fellowship, to be put out of the church, to have a death to fellowship. Certain sins don't. If a brother sins a sin that requires death of church fellowship, you know, he comes in and, and you know, he, he's been reported on the news that he just murdered somebody and you saw it in cold blood and the jury convicted him or whatever. You know, I mean, that's an obvious example. He, he was drunk in a bar somewhere and, and multiple witnesses saw it or whatever. That's a sin unto death, right? And, and that sin needs to be dealt with and it's not something that, you know, you pray, oh, Lord, don't judge him. Well, no, he needs to be judged, then repent, and he can be brought back in after he's uh, done his repentance and contrition. But that's what John's getting at. Anyway, I kind of got off on a tangent there. But the point is, what I really wanted from Jeremiah is that God told Jeremiah, do not pray for this people for their good. And Jeremiah, well, that's what he did. He didn't pray for their good. He prayed for them all right. But he prayed for their evil, that evil would happen to them. He was basically asking God to do what he had declared that he would. The next verse, John, um, Revelation, wow, Jeremiah, where that came from, Jeremiah fourteen twelve. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. This is the Lord speaking. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. This is why I say Jeremiah was basically doing exactly what God said. Don't pray for their good. I'm going to consume them with the sword, with the famine and the pestilence. And Jeremiah says, Lord, consume them with the sword, with the famine, with the pestilence. He's basically just asking God to do what he said he would. And there comes a time when God's long-suffering with sinners runs out. You remember Proverbs chapter 1. It's a lengthy passage, but wisdom cries and, and the sinners don't listen and eventually wisdom gets tired of crying and she says, Therefore shall you eat of the fruit of your own ways and be filled with your own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Right? That's in Proverbs 1, 22 through 32. Um, eventually, when, when wisdom cries long enough, then God just, he's, he just stops crying. And then he judges. Uh, Proverbs 29 and verse uh, 1 says these familiar words. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. And that was the condition that Israel was in. They had been reproved by the prophets, by Jeremiah, by Isaiah, by Ezekiel, by, by many of the prophets. They had been reproved for a long time, and they hardened their necks, and they wouldn't listen. And then their destruction came suddenly. And without remedy, God would not change his mind on it once it happened. And you read about that in Second Chronicles 36, uh, 14 through 21. Second Chronicles 36, 14 through 21. I know this is some heavy stuff. Next week's going to get lighter. so. But uh, this, is, this is pretty heavy stuff. Uh, 2 Chronicles 36, 14 through 21. This is the, the tail end of Israel's history. Well, prior to, the re, re, uh, prior to going back into the land. But um, that, that period there that ended the first national period of Israel's existence in the first temple, this is... This is describing that event. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, Jeremiah was one of them, rising up betimes, which means early, and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words 
and misused his prophets, just like Jeremiah, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans, the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden or old man, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And then it goes on to say that they destroyed the house of God and burned up everything and took the vessels and, and so on. The Lord was just, at that point, he was done. He spent years warning them and years being merciful to them. And eventually, it was judgment time. And that's basically what Jeremiah was praying. So therefore, if it's not wrong for our, or therefore it is not wrong for our long suffering to run out after a submit a, a sufficient amount of provocation as well. Um, Luke 13, 6 through 9. You want to remember that mercy rejoiceth against judgment. We always want to err on the side of mercy, but there does come a time eventually where your long suffering can run out, just like Jeremiah's did, just like God's did, and eventually then it's just time to to cut people off and pray that God will take care of them. Uh, Luke 13, 6 through 9. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig it, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So, you know, bear with people. Jeremiah bared with them, bore with them for a long time. Bear with people, but eventually there comes a time when it's okay to cut it down. It's okay to just say, you know what, I'm done. I'm done with you. I'm turning you over to God and letting him deal with you. All right, one more. And this isn't going to take but a minute. And this is in Lamentations. Lamentations 3, 64 through 66. Lamentations is the book right after Jeremiah. So Jeremiah prayed that God would recompense his persecutors according to their works, that he would give them sorrow of heart, curse them, and persecute them. Lamentations was written after Jerusalem was destroyed. That's, he's lamenting about the, the terrible condition of the city and uh, of its inhabitants, the ones that are left. They're in Lamentations uh, three sixty four through 66. He says, Render unto them a recompense, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. Give them sorrow of heart, thy curse unto them. Persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of the Lord. He was praying for God to do to the wicked what he's declared that he will, and we've seen this already um, in previous sections of this study, that God would basically do that, that same thing. He would persecute and destroy Jeremiah's persecutors. So his imprecatory prayer was therefore in accord with the will of God. So next time, that takes us through the whole Old Testament, as far as the ones that I found anyway, the imprecatory prayers. Next time, we are going to look at the New Testament, because some people might think, well, yeah, that was the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you had a lot of really you know, harsh things, and, but, but the New Testament is different, right? It, doesn't, it wouldn't condone such things. And we're actually going to see that the Apostle Paul, our example, that he prayed imprecatory prayers against people as well. Uh, so it's, it is allowed in both the Old and the New Testament. And then after we go through that, we're going to look at, you know, the some other angles of this and we're going to balance it all out and then give a conclusion, just sum it up very succinctly about when it's okay to pray imprecatory prayers. And that should conclude the study next week, Lord willing. So I thank you for your kind and patient attention uh, going through some pretty difficult and weighty stuff today.